Russia's full-scale invasion of Ukraine came as a shock to people around the world, but historically speaking, it's nothing new. Under Soviet leadership and now Vladimir Putin, Russia has frequently terrorized and invaded sovereign states, violently attempting to force its will on neighboring countries and countries all over the world. On this special edition of Hold the Line, we'll take a look at Russia's history of aggression from Afghanistan to Ukraine. Welcome to the special edition of Hold the Line. I'm Buck Sexton. Look, the Russians are not new to military incursion, invasion of other sovereign countries. We understand that this is something they've done numerous times. They've gone into Georgia. They've already taken Crimea and much of the Donbass region of eastern Ukraine. They've also had a military intervention in Syria on behalf of the Assad regime. They've gone into Afghanistan back in the end of the Soviet era as well. You'd think they might have learned a very painful and high casualty lesson from that, but it turns out their imperial ambitions continued even after the fall of the Berlin Wall. Let's take a look at current NATO nations and Russia to get a sense of where we stand here. As you can see, Russia still views itself as under threat from NATO and therefore wants to expand territorially and also in terms of its military and economic influence in ways to counter what's happening here, counter the NATO alliance that is arrayed, was arrayed against the Soviet Union. Back in February, Putin gave a speech in which he talked about the current situation uh, that's underway here. He said, for 30 years, we have persistently and patiently tried to reach an agreement with the leading NATO countries on the principles of equal and inviolable security in Europe. In response to our proposals, we constantly face either cynical deception and lies or attempts to pressure and blackmail, while NATO, despite all our protests and concerns, continues to steadily expand. The war machine is moving, and I repeat, it is coming close to our borders. So here's Putin trying to explain that he views this, believe it or not, he views offensive measures, such as what we're seeing right now in Ukraine with the war there, but also previous offensive measures, whether it's taking the Crimea and the Donbass region, the separatist area of eastern Ukraine, Russian-backed separatism, of course, and also South Ossetia and Abkhazia in Georgia. He views all of those maneuvers as defensive in nature because they are against the NATO alliance. So this is also how he justifies military incursion, military aggression against countries with which he is not at war. Putin is claiming and has claimed, including in his speech in February, that the West took Ukraine hostage. What is happening today, he said, does not come out of a desire to infringe on the interests of Ukraine and the Ukrainian people. It is related to the protection of Russia itself from those who took Ukraine hostage and are trying to use it against our country and its people. This is fascinating. This is quite a reversal, isn't it? Here you have someone who has engaged in multiple acts of aggression against military aggression against neighboring countries and does send troops around the world when he decides it's necessary, including to Syria, in order to expand Russian influence um, at the expense of other countries in the region, at the expense of movements determined to either oust dictators or achieve freedom or any number of things. He thinks that whether it's the incursion into Chechnya, uh, which the Russians engaged in under Putin's, uh, Putin's leadership, or the various Russian incursions into neighboring territory, Georgia and Ukraine, most notably, that this is fine, that this is actually defensive in nature because Russia has to stand up for itself and its allies. Quite a, an experience of reverse psychology here. And Putin, by the way, also told the West not to intervene in Ukraine. He said to anyone who would consider interfering from the outside, if you do, you will face consequences greater than any you have faced in history all the relevant decisions have been taken. I hope you hear me. I mean, he is threatening certainly major military reprisals against any Western country that would try to stop this madness in Ukraine. But also in the background, many say he's essentially brandishing his nuclear arsenal in order to back up the military aggression that he has engaged in in Ukraine. Where is all of this heading? Well, we've certainly seen that Russia has used previous invasions as a testing ground for both tactics and the response from NATO and the West and the international community. So what can we learn from those previous military 
uh, military decisions that Russia has made to go into foreign countries. Does that give us some template, some insight into where this conflict in Ukraine is heading? That's what we're going to address tonight in this special. We've got a great lineup of experts to give us insight into Russia's aggressive military policies. Coming up, it was called the Soviet Union's Vietnam. Moscow's 1979 invasion of Afghanistan was devastating, devastating for the Afghan people, but it might also have been the final nail in the coffin of the Soviet Empire. What do we learn from this? Stay with us. On December 24, 1979, the Soviet Union invaded Afghanistan. That invasion kicked off a brutal decade of warfare that would ultimately cost as many as 2 million lives, according to some estimates. The conflict would also mark the last major military operation of the Soviet Union, which fell less than three years after the war ended. Joining me now for a closer look at the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan is the director of the Heritage Foundation Center for National Defense, retired Army Lieutenant General Tom Spore. Tom, thanks for being with us. Thanks, thanks for having me, Buck. Okay, so let's just understand first, what was the decision-making process, and given what we're seeing right now with Putin and Ukraine, it might be helpful to understand the calculations at the time of the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan. What led up to, what were they trying to achieve? Yeah, and so Afghanistan had had a Marxist communist uh, puppet regime, if you will, for a couple of years prior to their, their invasion. But that regime was kind of under pressure from the Islamists in Afghanistan, and they were actually losing that war. And so the Soviet Union under then uh, Secretary Brezhnev started to get the sense that Afghanistan was gonna collapse. And it was that that uh, reading of what was going on in Afghanistan that ultimately caused them to choose to intervene in Afghanistan. How did it go in the early phase as the Soviets ramped up military operations there against the, the Afghan resistance? Uh, did they clearly had air superiority? I mean, how, how did the military operations look in the early phase of what turned into a decade long war? Yeah, the Soviets had initially a great uh, success, I guess you would say. They dropped airborne troops right into the capital, Kabul. They were successful in finding the, uh, the guy that was acting as president at the time and essentially neutralizing him, taking the reins of power and then capturing the major cities of Afghanistan. So you think Kandahar and others, those, re those fell relatively quickly uh, to the Soviets, unlike you know, what we are seeing in the Ukraine today. And so I think you'd have to say that the first few months, the Soviets had to have been uh, happy with how things went. Now, what were some of the changing, uh, the, the, the tipping points, if you will, or some of the momentum shifts that occurred uh, with the Mujahideen? And, and why was it that the course of this conflict started to turn against the Soviets? Yeah, the Mujahideen, even before the Soviets got there, were a powerful fighting force. That's, you know, that is what they do. That's their history. And so they were never a cohesive one group of Mujahideen. They were multiple warlords, but they kind of coalesced. And, and frankly, the Soviet invasion of their country really kind of made them have a common enemy that they all gathered around. And they there were at least 80, 800 different Mujahideen bases that they worked out of. The support of multiple nations, including the United States, the UK, Pakistan, and surprisingly enough, even at the time, China uh, helped keep the Mujahideen supplied and they became over time a more and more effective force, uh, employing famously Stinger missiles to bring down Soviet Hein helicopters and, and the like. So the changing of the advantage that the Soviets had from the air specifically, that was, I mean, this, this is known to most people as, as it's depicted in the movie Charlie Wilson's War, right? That, that was actually a major tactical shift then away from the complete air dominance superiority the Soviets had had because of those stingers? Yeah, that and plus the Mujahideen really controlled the countryside. So the, the Soviets kept and held the major cities. They really never lost any of them uh, to the Mujahideen. But the, the countryside, the roads, the connecting roads, those were really under um, the Mujahideen's control. And so in a situation like that, you can never really consolidate power if you only you know, can venture out of the cities in limited situations. So there was almost from the start, uh, the Soviets were in trouble in that invasion. What was the political calculation like for the Soviets toward, toward the end of it? To, to, was it? Was it just purely casualties in a sense that the 
military wasn't going to accomplish the mission of installing a communist puppet regime in Kabul? I mean, what, what brought about the end of the conflict? Yeah, a, a realization that they were not winning. They were just, it was just a stalemate. They had a change of leadership. Um, Gorbachev came in, you know, widely uh, viewed as a reformist kind of leader for the Soviet Union. He could see that they were spending billions of rubles, had spent thousands of lives and really had nothing to show for it. And so, in, like in other areas, Gorbachev decided to uh, reduce their losses in that area and started the withdrawal, I want to say, in around 1987. Uh, and it ended in 1989. Can you give us a sense of the kind of suppression tactics and the level of uh, brutality that the Soviets were willing to engage in to, in military parlance, perhaps pacify, uh, to, to suppress the resistance in Afghanistan? Uh, we know there was a very high civilian casualty count. What, what were the tactics that the Soviets used? What, what kind of, uh, of tactics and maneuvers were they deploying? You know, the Soviets use what white are widely recognized as war crimes to kind of suppress the Afghans. So they slaughtered uh, entire villages that had, you know, had the temerity to fight back against the Soviets. Uh, they raped uh, the women Af of Afghanistan. They they killed millions uh, of Afghans. Uh, bombed schools, churches, hospitals, and so really, the sky is the limit when you when you want to think about what went on in Afghanistan and what they did to the poor people of that country. Still unable to break the back of the resistance, though, as we know. And the Soviets had an ignominious withdrawal at the end of this. Some say that the ultimate collapse of the Soviet Union, if not triggered by, was hastened, at least, by this failed war, this failed military invasion of Afghanistan. What do you say to that? I think that's very true. And so, you know, we, we think about the big moments, you know, Ronald Reagan saying, Mr. Gorbachev, tear this wall down and we think about the Star Wars initiative, I think you have to put the war in Afghanistan and, the, and their failure there and all the millions of uh, dollars of rubles they spent there, that really, I think, helped bring down that evil regime. And as we look today at the situation in Ukraine, do you feel that there are lessons learned uh, from the international community and from the Western powers about what happened to the Soviets in Afghanistan and what should be applied now to Ukraine? Yeah, you know, I, I think there's a lot of lessons. There's a lot of similarities. I mean, and there's a lot of differences too. The Soviets thought they were going to have great, I think, initial success in the Ukraine and underestimated the resistance there. And you can see the same thing uh, playing out again in the Ukraine now. And so I think the it, it's hard for the Ukrainian people. I think um, they are making a difference. We can't see it now because we're so close to the conflict now. As we zoom back and as we see this maybe from... Uh, a little bit more distance, I think we're going to see that their bravery is going to make a huge difference. Lieutenant Colonel, thanks so much for being with us. We appreciate it, sir. Thank you, sir. In 1992, a small territory known as Chechnya declared its independence from the Russian Federation, a move that would lead to two brutal wars with Russia and cost thousands of lives. When we come back, Jim Brook of the Foundation for the Defense of Democracies joins us to give his insight into the Chechen wars. Stay with us. A year after the fall of the Soviet Union, Chechnya, a small territory in Russia's southwestern region, declared independence from the Russian Federation. Unlike other republics at the time, Chechnya's independence was rejected by Moscow and would spark two wars over the course of the next decade and a half. Chechen separatists waged a brutal guerrilla war against Russian forces, and the wars would ultimately cost tens of thousands of Russian and Chechen lives. Joining me now is Russia-Ukraine fellow at the Foundation for Defense of Democracies and former Moscow Bureau Chief for Bloomberg, Jim Brook. Jim, thanks for being with us. Thank you. So, Jim, let's start with the first Chechen war, which started in 1994. What's the background on this? And why, for example, wouldn't the Russians, after the fall of the Soviet Union, allow Chechen to secede like other territories had? Well, Chechnya is an overwhelmingly Muslim population, a long history of, of mountain guerrillas, fierce fighters, and the Russians were afraid of letting Chechnya go because there's a whole swath in Russia that could cut the country in half that is Muslim. Uh, Tartistan, Bashorjistan, uh, several little stands there. They happen to be called, uh, they're on the Volga, and they could literally cut Russia in half. Uh, 
So uh, first Yeltsin, then Putin wanted to send a very clear message to the other Islamic majority republics, which are inside Russia, that they were not going to get independence and the country would not be cut in half. And so how did hostilities begin and what was the so that the, the Russians went in under what pretext in, into Chechnya in 1994, obviously to stop the uh, stop the secession movement there. But how, how was it in the early days? Obviously, we're looking at the situation in Ukraine now and trying to figure out if there are any parallels or you know, strategic comparisons to draw. Yeah, and your video shows terrible parallels. Uh, it was basically scorched earth. To, it started off with the che ethnic Chechen members of the Red Army basically formed their own army and took their own uh, weapons with them. And there was a Chechen general who uh, became president. Uh, they, they launched their own war of genocide against ethnic Russians, and they fought uh, Russia into a, a stalemate. They got independence recognized by virtually nobody. And that brings up to about 1999, uh, 2000, when Putin was up for the presidency. Then things get very sinister. There were three apartment bombings in, in the Russian part of Russia, which killed hundreds of people. And the third one, they discovered some FSB, which is the later KGB uh, operatives, uh, basically piling fertilizer into the basement of a building. These men were detained, arrested. But the thinking is that Putin and his FSB cohorts planned these uh, terrible apartment bombings, I say killed hundreds of people, to rally the country behind him and his tough policies with Chechnya. Uh, I was sort of in and out of Russia around that time. By the time I got there, which is 2006, the war was still going on. And I visited um, Chechnya, Grozny, the capital, in 2012. And it was like a Disneyland. It was everything was cute, everything's rebuilt. There was even a toy Orthodox church. He had leveled Grozny, the capital of Chechnya. It looked like Stalingrad. It had been totally leveled. And then when he got control again of Chechnya, he rebuilt it. So that's a scary parallel that he basically destroyed the capital and destroyed this so called country in order to keep it inside underneath the Russian umbrella. How did the, the, I know there were two Chechen conflicts, and we're trying to give at least some some background here on on both of them for everybody watching. The first Chechen war ended how and why? The church, first Chechen war ended basically with a victory of the guerrillas, and uh, Yeltsin grudgingly kind of gave up, and the guerrillas announced a independent nation, which was recognized by virtually nobody. And that lasted for two or three years. And then, uh, especially when Putin came back, the Russians decided to have another go at it and used even tougher uh, strategies, including essentially carpet bombing, uh, really destroying the city. So, so that would be the, uh, second, the second conflict. So let's say that the first, the first Chechen incur incursion into Chechnya fails. Yeltsin says, all right, and there's a something of a de facto independence for Chechnya during that period, as you say, doesn't get everybody to actually recognize it in the international scene. Then Putin takes charge. And 1999, is that the, again in 1999, they roll in and different tactics. What's, what's the approach? Well, as I said, it's scorched earth. Uh, now, the Chechens had a lot of Saudi jihadist uh, money. So they were not orphans, let's say, on the international scene. They had money and weapons. And, uh, and I think one of the Saudi kings threatened Putin several years ago, you know, we can turn Chechnya back on, <laughs> kind of a sinister threat. But to answer your question, uh, Putin won control of Chechnya through very uh, vicious, brutal methods, uh, scorched earth, I said, heavy bombing, uh, tons of civilians were killed. And, uh, and basically batter them into submission. And when I moved to Moscow in 2006, it went on for several more years, but there was a huge amount of um, sensitivity in Russia to uh, dead soldiers coming back. And there were these committees of mothers of soldiers and uh, the burials were hidden and uh, they really did not want a repeat of Afghanistan, although they, they lost thousands of men in Chechnya by, by all accounts.
So there are reports right now that there are specific uh, Chechen fighters, uh, men loyal to uh, Katerov, right? The, the authoritarian Kadyrov. leader of, of Chechnya, yeah. uh, that they're going to be fighting, that they are fighting in Ukraine. What can you tell us about that? Well, there are apparently Chechens on both sides. Chechens are very uh, brutal fighters. Their, their national sport is wrestling. Um, they, they really enjoy fighting. They're, they're natural born fighters, knife fighters, gunfighters. And the Chechens who lost the war against Putin have either been in exile in Europe or elsewhere, and they've come back to join the Ukrainians. So the Ukrainian government has a few Chechens on their side, and then the Russian government has said, sent Chechens into Ukraine uh, reportedly to uh, assassinate President Zelensky. Um, and we know the Chechens have been in the Russian-controlled parts of southeastern Ukraine since 2014. How far they go, I don't know. Uh, there's a very interesting memorial. Um, the World War II Museum in Kiev has a section to the foreign volunteers, uh, Chechens and Georgians, who've come to fight in Ukraine against the Russians. So this is not totally new that men, Chechen and Georgian men, uh, looking for a chance to shoot Russians would go to Ukraine. Jim, we want to come back in a second here and talk about Georgia. Stay with us, if you would, please. Because back in 2008, Vladimir Putin invaded the Republic of Georgia using a lot of the same pretexts we're seeing here in Ukraine present day. When we come back, we'll be rejoined by Jim Brooke, who's going to give insight on the Russo-Georgian war and how some of those tactics are being replayed right now in Ukraine. Stay with us. Many consider it the first European war of the 21st century. In 2008, Russia invaded the Republic of Georgia, a former Soviet state which had achieved independence in 1991. The war would only last two weeks, and it ended with Russia's recognition of two regions in Georgia as independent, Abkhazia and South Ossetia. Although these two areas are not internationally recognized, they've become de facto countries closely aligned with Russia, an outcome many believe Vladimir Putin wants to repeat in Ukraine. Joining me once again is Russia-Ukraine fellow at the Foundation for Defense of Democracies and former Moscow bureau chief for Bloomberg, Jim Brook. Jim, thanks so much. Thank you, Buck. And I was also the VOA Voice of America bureau chief in Moscow, which brought me to places like Georgia and Grozny, which you just mentioned. Indeed. So the Russian invasion of Georgia, Jim, is seen by many today as the most analogous to Putin's invasion of Ukraine on, on a number of levels. Could you just walk us through what, what was the, the pretext for Russia's invasion of Georgia? What were the factors at play right before and, and in the, in the run-up to this? Yeah, Buck, very good question. I was in Georgia the first week of the war, just almost by accident. And then in the fog of war, we really didn't know what was going on. But now uh, journalists and historians have put together the TikTok, the timeline. What happened was that George W. Bush went to the NATO summit in Bucharest in April and strongly urged Europe to accept Georgia and Ukraine as members of NATO. The Germans, the French, and the Brits kind of pushed the whole thing off until December. The Russians got very alarmed. And we now know within a week started drawing up a plan to invade Georgia. At the same time, the Russian Duma asked President uh, Putin to recognize these two separatist areas as separate republics. I bring this up because all this happened again uh, with Ukraine. Then the Russian railroad troops went in Abkhazia, reinforced the railroad, which and where the Russian railroad troops go, soldiers follow. So people should have drawn connections there. Then there were uh, two weeks of maneuvers just north of the, of the Georgian border. And when the maneuvers are over, they left behind a thousand pieces of equipment. They did not go home. I'm talking about armored personnel carriers, tanks, trucks, jeeps, this sort of thing. That weekend, and when I was in uh, Georgia that weekend, they started to accuse, um, accuse Georgia of genocide. And uh, they started to evacuate civilians from South Ossetia. And I saw these hysterical reports out of South Ossetia by Russian correspondents that they were loading women and children on 
uh, buses and sending them up into the safety of Russia. Um, this is exactly what happened in the last two weeks with Ukraine. There was the Duma asked Putin to recognize the, the separatist republics as independent nations. There were maneuvers. The equipment did not go home. Putin accused George, uh, accused Ukraine of genocide, and um, and the civilians were evacuated. Then, in the case of Georgia, back in August 2008, 2008 um, there's a lot of cross-border shelling, line across line shelling, and that was sort of the warm-up. In that case, uh, the president of Georgia, Mikhail Saakashvili, fell for the bait, and he actually attacked, you know, it's the mouse that roared, he attacked Georgia. He, Georgia attacked Russia, and that led to um, the Russians whacking back very severely. And they poured through the only tunnel through the Caucasus Mountains, and they cut Georgia in half. Georgia is an east-west country, and they cut the railroad, they cut the highway, uh, they bombed Gori, or the birthplace of Stalin, and then they started moving east and stopped about 25 miles short of the capital, which is Tbilisi. So they did it. Um, you can pick nits with how the military behaved, but they basically uh, took Georgia in about 10 days, as you say, and then uh, they had to sue for peace. So, so the, these two, fine. Jim, if I can just ask, sorry, these two areas of Georgia that were, as I understand it, largely Russian speaking, uh, South Ossetia and, and Abkhazia, uh, they were the separate, they're the separatist enclaves. That was over, a, what, a, over a decade ago now. Where do those countries, or separatist enclaves, whatever we call them, currently stand have they been formally absorbed into the Russian Federation? No, they, they claim to be independent countries. And I visited Abkhazia for Voice of America, and it was kind of a creepy place because the population is half of what it was before the war. Uh, now, the Georgians had done their own bit of ethnic cleansing, so they're not totally innocent in this. But uh, uh, the population is 150,000 compared to 300,000 before the war. It's a beautiful part. Uh, all these rivers, the has come down, they're wonderful beaches, it's, it's subtropical, it's lovely. But it's this kind of phony country. And I got in hot water with VOA in Washington because I datelined my stories, uh, you know, Sumi or Sukumi Abhazia. And they said, well, Abhazia is not a country recognized by the United States or anyone in Europe, so you cannot put that dateline on your story. So uh, these two areas continue to claim they're independent, they have their own flag, um, but they're 100% subsidized by Russia. They're basically an extension of Russian power uh, south of the Russian border. There, there are thousands of Russian troops permanently stationed in both places. So is your expectation then in Ukraine, the, the, the Georgia secession or Georgia separatist enclave playbook is going to be what the Russian strategy is, at least in the east and the Donbass region? I mean, how, how does that play out in your mind? Yeah, Buck, it's already happened. In the Duma recommended that the two separatist regions of Ukraine be recognized as countries, and Putin did just that last week. He recognized these two areas as separate countries, and then he, he made his big invasion like the next day. Um, I don't know what's going to happen in Ukraine. My fear, on one level, Russia's losing on the ground. My fear is that Putin will lose patience and come back with the air war and flatten a couple of Ru Ukrainian cities to give them a lesson, so, so to speak. Uh, Jim, we hot, you yeah. go ahead, go ahead. No, I mean, this is what Putin did. That's one way he won in Chechnya, and it's what he did more recently in Syria. Uh, he flattened much of this Idlib province uh, without you know, hitting hospitals, apartment buildings, whatever. And he is ruthless and has no compunction about killing civilians. And unless there's a no-fly zone over Ukraine, which uh, the U.S. and the EU don't really want to do, and it would be the U.S. that have to maintain it, um, he will be fairly free to bomb the heck out of uh, Ukraine. Jim Brooke, thanks so much for joining us today. Appreciate the expertise and the perspective. Thank you. In 2015, as Bashar al-Assad, president of Syria, fought for his life during the Syrian civil war, Russian forces intervened to help prop up his regime. We come back, Bill Rogio of the Foundation for Defense of Democracy stops by to give his insight into Russia's intervention in Syria. Stay right there.
It's now day seven of the war in Ukraine. Russia continues to bombard the country with bombs and missiles, targeting crowded population centers. And the capital city is, for now, still uncaptured by Putin, but we'll see. Our next guest says that sympathy for the outnumbered and outgunned defenders of Kyiv has led to the exaggeration of Russian setbacks, misunderstanding of Russian strategy, and even baseless claims from amateur psychoanalysts that Putin has lost his mind. Bill Roggio, senior fellow at the Foundation for Defense of Democracies, joins now to explain. Bill, thanks for being with us. Thanks for having me, Buck. So let's just start with what's the latest today with the Russian advance? How is this going? Yeah, in the north at, at Kiev, the capital, um, Russians are preparing their encirclement. Uh, that could happen within days. And they're preparing to link up with, I'm seeing, I think this is close to happening, uh, cutting off two provinces north of Kiev. Um, and that would secure the entire border uh, between Ukraine and Russia, uh, as well as Belarus. But more importantly, in the south, the city of Kherson, um, which is in the um, in the Black Sea, on the coast of the Black Sea, a uh, city of 300,000 people has just fallen to the Russians. The mayor of, of Kherson um, said that 10 Russian officers have come to the building and he's handed over control. Um, the tr- uh, Ukrainian troops have retreated to a nearby city and the Russians continue their advance. So let's look at what Biden said last night in general about this Russian invasion of Ukraine. I want to have you respond to it. Play. Six days ago, Russia's Vladimir Putin sought to shake the very foundations of the free world, thinking he could make it bend to his menacing ways. But he badly miscalculated. He thought he could roll into Ukraine and the world would roll over. Instead, he met with a wall of strength he never anticipated or imagined. He met the Ukrainian people. Now that he's acted, the free free world is holding him accountable. Putin is now isolated from the world more than he has ever been. Putin has unleashed violence and chaos. But while he may make gains on the battlefield, he'll pay a continuing high price over the long run. Uh, What's your assessment of Biden, the commander in chief's analysis of Ukraine in that speech? Well, you know, again, I I, I do agree the Ukrainian people have put up a a, a hell of a fight, but it's just not enough. And I think he's overly optimistic. Um, He claimed that Russia sought a quick victory. And one of the things that I analyze in that Daily Mail article um, is that, in fact, the Russians have have a, a plan, and this is a plan that will take time to execute. It's not; it was never going to be a quick victory. Um, we'll see how uh, how the West, the West, and the international community holds up. Is it willing to to do sanctions? Sanctions are easy today. What about next week? Next month? What about next winter? When? Germany uh, needs that 50% of its gas comes from Russia. Um, I, I think this is a, you know, he is, it's not as overly optimistic as I expected um, it's him to be. I expected to hear him say things like the Russians are failing, but I think it's, this is certainly the best case scenario, the rosy glasses scenario that he painted. Um, the reality is the West needed to do far more months prior to this invasion to both deter the Russians and prepare the Ukrainians for war. That didn't happen. And by the way, this does not make him a wartime commander in chief. This country is not at war with Russia and does not have plans to go to war with Russia. So there's a lot of reporting on this 40-mile-long Russian military convoy that is on the way to Kyiv. Is, is the, the, the basic strategy here that they will be deploying uh, soon to just encircle the city and demand the government and Zelensky effectively you know, resign, give up, call for surrender? Uh, how do you think this plays out? Yeah, I think that's exactly right. I think this this uh, formation, it's already pushing west, south and west of Kiev. And I do believe it, it is being um, its uh, goal. Main, main purpose is to surround the city and, and force the capitulation of the government. I also think that it, it will look to link up with troops that are currently in the south. Um, and this would split Ukraine in half. This would, and this really would be endgame. You'd have much of Ukraine, Ukraine's military trapped behind enemy lines. If those troops in the Caucasus can link up with the troops in Kyiv, then I really think that we, we'd be talking endgame here for Ukraine as a viable state. 
It might get so, abrupt Ukrainian state, um, or Putin may decide to take the whole thing and push to the Polish border. That's that's really the next level question there. So how much do you think the air campaign, the Russian airstrikes, uh, and also long range artillery strikes, missile strikes, is going to escalate and, and play a major role in this in the days ahead? Because up to this point, there's a lot of footage of uh, of Russian convoys getting, you know, getting hit, looks like getting hit pretty hard with some of those anti-tank munitions that the Ukrainians now have because of Western partners and have been they've been getting those for a while. So there is this this view that people have of, well, it's just going to continue to be a hard slog on the ground for the Russians. Do you think they're just going to take to the air much more heavily and start pounding Ukrainian positions in a way that the Ukrainian defenses aren't really able to handle at all? Well, I think they can do that, and if they they can do that via the air and via artillery and rocket rocket uh, munitions as well. I mean, look, we just saw a city sh- surrender after a couple of days of fighting, basically surrender without a fight. Do the Ukrainians have this kind of fight? By the way, the Russians are taking casualties. That's without a doubt. Um, the Russian military doctrine is the old Soviet military doctrine. You throw a lot of uh, force at it. You expect to take losses, but in the end you win. But the Ukrainians themselves are also being depleted of munitions. Why is that convoy, the, that 40 mile long convoy that is nor- just north of 20 miles north of Kiev? and advancing westward. Why is that not being striked? Do the Ukrainians have the capability and munitions to do this? The Ukrainians are being ground down as well. Um, you know, and I think the example set at Kherson may be one, and particularly if the Russians are able to um, rule a city like Kherson and not uh, have reprisals against civilians, which I don't think is in their interest anyway. They want to rule the country, not dominate and crush it. You know, it sends a message to Kiev, the people of Kiev, that you may want to surrender this one. It's, it, you know, it's better than being, you know, better to live than being crushed. What do you think the Putin strategy looks like as it plays out over the weeks ahead, Bill, at this point? I think Putin has calculated that as far as sanctions go, that there is probably a time limit on these. I think that is his calculation. I don't know the whether he's made the correct calculation or not. Um, militarily, I think that, you know, what I described earlier, that push from the south from uh, from Crimea is looking to link up with Kiev. That'll sever the country in half, trap a large number of Ukrainian forces, and if Ki- and take over Kiev and a couple of major cities, and show the Ukrainian people that you know the Russians are in control. They've won this war. Then the only real question is: Is does he want the whole country, or is he looking for a rump state that is neutral or is um, governed by a crony of his? I think that's what you know. Um, that's what we're looking at here in the next days and months. Um, I, I, the real big question for me again is, does he want it all or is he happy with half of Ukraine and then a pliable state to the West? Bill, uh, what could be done, if anything, to stop that in your mind? Is it just really all, all in the Ukrainians or are there outside sanctions, economic activity, economic actions that could be taken to make him change his calculation? I think short of a NATO military intervention, which I do not advocate for, that increases the risk of direct what it would be direct war with Russia and increases the risk of a nuclear war. Short of that, I think what you're going to see, and I don't can't tell you if it takes days, weeks or months, that the Russians will conquer most, if not all of the Ukraine. Um, and I don't think there's sanctions won't stop this. Uh, diplomatic actions won't stop this. Prevention of, of, of flights, uh, Russian flights, things of that. That's not enough. Putin has put all of his cards on the table. He has gone all in on taking Ukraine. Um, he can't turn back now. He would he would no longer be president of the country if he did. Um, he, he's playing to win. While I think the West is just playing to get a best case scenario out of this, get some type of rump Ukrainian government out of this at this point. Bill, uh, I agree with you. I think uh, I hope we're both wrong, but I think you're right. Thanks for being with us as always. Good to see you. <laughs> That's all the time we have for this special edition of Hold the Line. I'd like to thank my guests, Tom Spore, Jim Brook, and Bill Rogio for sharing their expertise. Bill O'Reilly comes up next. Shields high.